evening, y'all. Um, welcome to Our Lady of Mount Carmel Parish. Welcome to a little presentation on Venerable Bishop Lawrence F. Schott. Before we go any further, let's pray. And I will explain why I chose this prayer in a minute. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, inspired by your example, I now resolve never to surrender to disappointment or depression, never to entertain morbid, unhappy thoughts. My weakness and my limitations, my loneliness, my failure, my defects of body and soul, I accept. The burden and the hardship of my lot, I accept. It is all fitted into your plan, and it will all contribute to your glory. If I cheerfully accept it, so I do accept whatever you permit. I will be my best self, asking nothing, refusing nothing, content to be such as I am, for this is what you wish me to be. I will never again complain because I find myself on that low level down to which you stooped when you came to lift me up. You did this willingly for love's sake. For love's sake, then, I accept all that is implied in my having the defects and the weaknesses, the needs and the infirmities, the appetites and the desires which belong to an animal. And I am grateful, not only for the soul you gave me, I am grateful for this body, too. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I chose this prayer because Father Frank and I have been using this little prayer book all summer long before our meals. This prayer book is more than special than just that, though. It is called Think and Pray. And if I go to the inside cover, Father Lawrence F. Schott, December Spiritual Book, 1936. This book was written in 1936, or published in 1936, and this was Bishop Schott's spiritual reading for the month of December of that year. And this prayer is underlined. Bishop Schott underlined a few lines, but the ones that I like is, I will be my best self. For this is what you wish me to be. I think, uh, so this was 1936. This would have been 15 or so years before he was ordained a bishop. At this point, he was just a priest. He wasn't even here in Mount Carmel yet. It was 13 years before he ever came to. And he was already trying to nurture this humble heart. As a parish priest, as a young priest, as a young man, that probably was pretty easy. Little did he know in the future he would become a bishop. But he was able to become a bishop, I think, because he had a humble heart. Now, tonight, I'm going to keep this short. One, because I don't have that much to say. Two, because you probably don't want to hear me talk that much. But why am I talking about Bishop Schott? Who am I? I'm Kevin Key. I'm a seminarian for the Diocese of Harrisburg, which is where we are. I'm here with Father Frank for the summer at Our Ladies, learning from him, learning about the church here in Coal Country, learning how to be a parish priest from Father Frank. And part of my assignment here this summer, given to me by Father Frank, was to give a, do a little research and give a little presentation on Bishop Schott, because Father has a great interest in him. And after learning a little bit about him, I understand why. I understand why Father Frank values this so much. Because, well, it was interesting because I'm not from here, right? I I didn't even know Harrisburg had an auxiliary bishop until I came here this summer. And my very first day, Father showed me a picture and a couple things about him. I didn't even know we had a bishop. But it makes sense that Father Frank wants me to talk about Bishop Schott because what he symbolizes. I don't know if he was a good holy man. I don't know that. I don't know if you know that because it's hard to know another person's soul. But what he represents as a diocesan priest from this area 
who then became a bishop and stayed and served in this area and served as well as he did, he represents is the pride and the quality of the people here in the coal country. I'm not from here, but I have seen that all summer long. The quality of the Catholics here in coal country. And Bishop Schott represents that. In fact, he's not the only bishop from this area. You all already know this. And this is part of my connection to the area. My one claim, Bishop William Walter Scheid, Billy from the Gap, as you know him, uh, is also from coal country and is also an auxiliary bishop. I know Bishop Walter Scheid from when he was my pastor in St. Pat's and Carlisle many years ago. So Bishop Schott and Bishop Walter Scheid represent this quality of Catholicism here in the coal country. So... That's why we're learning about him. That's why I got to learn about him. I'm sure I know. I'm not sure. I do know for a fact that a lot of you know him personally, knew him personally. Know your own stories that you can tell about him personally. Well, Father Frank didn't ask you to talk about him. <laughs> if you have a bone to pick, talk to Father Frank about it. But I'm going to do my best, and I'm going to share a few stories I learned from some of you and also some research I did, digging in old archives. Look at this. This is a newspaper, The Standard and Times, a Catholic newspaper from Philadelphia for 10 cents from March 15, 1963. I have a copy of it in the back. It's a, not a great copy, but if you want to look at it, you can go back there and see it. Um, this newspaper was printed in '63 about when Bishop Schott died. So I was looking through all these wonderful old documents to learn a little bit about him and what he did. Um, so you can see that, but go look at the copy. I don't want this to fall apart. <laughs> uh, who was he? Well, I have some stories to tell, a little bit I learned about his personality, and then some things he did. So a little bit about his personality first. Um, Bishop Schott or in his background. Bishop Schott is from Philly originally, actually. That's where his family came from, but he moved up to Danville when he was three years old. So he's really, even though he wasn't born here, he was raised in coal country. In fact, he still has family in Danville, and I believe his grandniece is with us? Cousin. A cousin of the great Bishop Schott is here. So the family is still in the area. Um, so he was from Danville when he was ordained for the Diocese of Harrisburg, and he served a number of places, including uh, another connection to me. He served at St. Patrick's in Carlisle, but specifically, back then we had gobs of priests. They were, they were looking for any job to give to a priest. So what he, his only responsibility, his full-time job was campus minister to Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. My connection is I'm from there, and my dad teaches there. Up until five years ago, my dad was the um, faculty representative of the Newman Center on campus. So I've actually had a connection to Dickinson and their campus ministry my whole life. Um, growing up, we would sometimes go to the campus mass, um, which would be celebrated by the men, the priests who have come after Bishop Schott. He started the program at Dickinson, and he didn't just start the campus ministry program at Dickinson, he started all college campus Catholic ministry for the Diocese of Harrisburg. That was the first program our diocese had for college campuses. That has grown to cover almost every single college in our diocese now. So just up north in Bloomsburg, they have their own beautiful building just for Catholic campus ministry. Um, Father Shala is a Dominican up there, and I know him well. I know him because, again, he used to be at St. Pat's in Carlisle, and he was the campus minister at Dickinson College. So he's kind of following Bishop Schott's footsteps. He went from Carlisle and Dickinson back to coal country. Um, Bloomsburg has a great place, campus ministry. In fact, um, I saw a picture on a wall, and in that picture is a young man who went to Bloomsburg was impacted by the Bloomsburg Catholic Campus Ministry and is now a seminary for our diocese. I go to school with him down in Philly. So this, this great legacy that Bishop Schott created 
is impacting our church still today. Another um, connection that, this is a more, uh, not much of a connection, but it's a coincidence. Um, in Carlisle, there's a military barracks. Now, my family, we're not in the military at all, um, but I've lived next to the military barracks my whole life, and my grandfather fought in World War II. Bishop Schott had a personal interest, before he was a bishop, when he was just a priest, he had a personal interest in the USO, the United Service organization, specifically the NCCS, which was the National Catholic Community Services. That would be the Catholic branch of the USO before they were merged into one. Um, Bishop Schott had a really, really invested interest in supporting the troops, in encouraging young men to join the military. Bishop Schott, even here at Our Lady of Mount Carmel, would tell young men how great of a career opportunity the military was because you supported your country, defended your country, you had a good, steady job the rest of your life, and it, it meant you stood for something, right? There was, there was integrity in the military, and Bishop Schott knew that, and he shared that with the young men. He supported that uh, throughout his priesthood, actually, um, so much so that in the back, again, that I have three bulletins from Bishop Schott's time here. One... Not bulletins. Three books of bulletins. Our archives are great. We have all the bulletins for the parish going back to 1949, which was Bishop Schott's first year as a priest here at Our Ladies as the pastor. So I have 1949, all the bulletins back there. I have 1952 and 1956. 1952 was the year he was made a Monsignor. 1956 is the year he was made a bishop. Um, I have, in the 1956 book, I have a couple important bulletins marked um, announcing that he was being made a bishop and then scheduling his first bishop's math here at Our Ladies. And then a couple interesting things. Um, I couldn't find in 1949 and 1952 any announcements about him coming here or about him being made a Monsignor. So if you look through it and you find it, let me know. I'll mark it. All right? Um, he supported the military throughout his... Oh, yes, throughout his ministry. There's uh, lots of letters and collections in the bulletins showing how much Our Ladies would support men. They would support men um, in the war. They would support veterans and they would support men joining the military even after World War II. So Bishop Schott had a great love of the USO, the NCCS, and just our military in general. So there's a couple of his interests and things he did. A little bit about him. Um, Anne-Marie Muldoon's here. She was one of my the people I talked to to find out who Bishop Schott was. Um, a lot of what we know of him is as pastor here at Our Ladies. So he arrived in 1949 and had seven years before he was made a bishop in 56. And then he served as pastor and auxiliary bishop from 56 to 63. So it was about half of this time here where he was just a regular priest. The other half, he was pastor and bishop. So how did he balance that? Well, he balanced it well. Because... The sense I get from the people who knew him is during his whole 14 years, from 49 to 63, all, all 14 years of that, he was first and foremost the pastor of Our Ladies. He wasn't trying to build a resume. He wasn't trying to win any awards or do any great spectacular things. At the end of the day, what he cared about was being pastor here at Our Ladies. And in my mind, that's the best thing he could have been. He did do lots of other great things, but he was ordained to be a parish priest. That's what God called him to be, and it sounds like that was his priority too. That doesn't mean he was just some cuddly parish priest, you know. And he wasn't no simpleton or country bumpkin. He was still a force of nature. That's why he was made a bishop. You did what Bishop Schott told you to do. Anne-Marie didn't say that just because she was his employee. I think that's a sense of his power. There's a picture of him 
He looks like a friendly guy. And I asked Anne Marie, well, what did he sound like? And she said he had a little gruff voice. If a bishop dressed up in his full regalia told me to do something, I would do it. Yes, sir. In fact, uh, just next door at the old high school, which is now our community center, um, back when that was the high school, Frank Bach told me that Bishop Schott was, if, if you misbehaved enough, it would make it all the way to him. And he would be the last person you answer to. So if you were misbehaving over at the high school, Catholic high school, the sisters would reprimand you. And if you kept up with it, they'd bring you to Bishop Schott's office over in the rectory. And you'd go in, and he would give you a stern talking to. And then he'd send you back to the sisters and say, don't do it again. And then he would tell the sisters, boys will be boys. (laughs) Now, some people might not like that today, but... I think that's a healthy perspective. You know, we're all human. We're all going to mess up and correct where there needs to be correcting, but also, you know, give people some slack. Let them grow. Let them improve. And I think Bishop Schott knew that. Boys will be boys. What else did he do? What else was he like? He was very supportive. He was always around. Like I said, his first priority was being a parish priest, a pastor. Um... I just found out, just beforehand, that he would come out when the little kids would have recess right here. He's a really important man in charge of a big parish, a blooming parish. He was pastor here back during the heyday, when Cole was king. He had to go down to Harrisburg for countless things. He was doing confirmations all over the whole diocese. He would make time to be present to middle school kids during recess. He would make time. He really, really valued sports in the town. He supported all of Mount Carmel's sports. In fact, you could guarantee that you would see him down at the baseball field smoking a cigar on any home game. I can't imagine smoking as many cigars as he would. I heard, you can believe this or not, I heard that after Mass, he would sometimes have his coffee and breakfast with parishioners and smoke a cigar. In the morning, 9 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock in the morning. Father Frank, can I start doing that? Uh, I'm going to take the morning off and smoke a cigar. Can you imagine? No, we got work to do. Father Frank works me. We're too busy. But he was making time to be with the people. I think that's what it means. And he was down at the baseball games, present, supporting the kids of the parish, supporting the community. And that was what he valued. He, he, he really did balance. Um, he, he, he had a lot of work, but I think he really did balance his work here at Our Ladies and his work in the diocese. Because as a bishop, you do have diocesan-level responsibilities. He would have been in charge of one, if not multiple, offices in the diocese at the chancery. I don't know where it was back then, but now it's on 4800 Union Deposit. So he would have had to drive all the way down there one or two or three times a week. Not to mention going around to other parishes for confirmation, because only a bishop can normally do confirmation. So he would have been really, really busy doing these other responsibilities, but he was still always present in here. All right, what are some things he said? What did he do? Uh, in the bulletins, this was a little, a little problem for me. I don't know who wrote the bulletins. They don't have the titles or anything like that. Anne Marie, did you write the bulletins? Would, were you the one who read up the bulletins? Anne-Marie typed all those bulletins. So if you go back there and you see those books, they're typewritten. You're all old enough. You probably all use typewriters. Well, for anyone on YouTube who's under the age of 50, they're typewritten. <laughs> that means... And then the mimeograph would copy them and make all the copies, yeah. So that's Anne-Marie's work back there. She did a great job. Did Bishop Schott ever give you anything to add in? Ever give you anything to put in specifically? All right. Well, there are some beautiful things in there. And I don't know if Anne-Marie wrote them them, or Bishop Schott wrote them, but I'm going to read them because of how beautiful they are. Um, And the reason I picked this is because they used to celebrate 40 hours in May. Father Frank and I this summer just decided that next year, 2022, Our Ladies would have our 40 hours again in May. 
Father Frank picked that time because the weather's better. But little did he know, that's when Bishop Schott had 40 hours. So you're following good feet, Father. So this is what Bishop Schott, through the bulletin, through Anne-Marie, said about 40 hours. Everyone in the parish will want to express their gratitude to the Son of God for this great sacrament by which he lives in the tabernacle of our churches and is received into our hearts in Holy Communion. I, I really like this next part. The 40 hours devotion to Jesus in the Holy Eucharist is the most beautiful and fruitful of all Catholic devotions. It is held at this time of the year because the anniversary of the institution of the Blessed Sacrament, Holy Thursday, occurs during Lent when we are not able to celebrate it becomingly. Um, this was 1949, before Vatican II, you wouldn't hold any celebrations during Lent. So, even though Holy Thursday, the celebration of this Blessed Sacrament, falls during Lent and would be a great time to celebrate 40 hours, they wouldn't, out of respect for Lent. So that's why they held it in May. The entire life of the Church is centered about its Eucharistic tabernacle of God. The Blessed Sacrament is the sacred fountain whence comes the life-giving grace to the thirsting and troubled souls of men. All families will want to arrange to spend a period of adoration before the Blessed Sacrament. This is the time when our Blessed Savior holds court in our parish and distributes his favors generously to everyone who comes to him. Surely, every man who is able to walk will want to pay this external tribute of honor to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Now listen to this part. During the war, our men stood at attention and honored many of their ranking officers. This is an opportunity for every man of our parish to show his love and respect for our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. So, it's a beautiful reflection on the Blessed Sacrament and the devotion of 40 hours, but that last bit, you can see his love and connection to the U.S. military, using that connection from the war and standing at attention, showing respect. He's saying, the way we showed respect to officers, we should show even more respect to God in the Blessed Sacrament. And to all you who came for the Holy Hour beforehand, you did that. Good job. Um, another parish, and so I'm not going to read this whole one, but he talked about um, supporting seminarians and the collections that the parish would hold. So I have to talk about this, because I'm a seminarian. So that still happens. Our ladies in all the parishes in the diocese still have collections that help me and all of my brother seminarians go through seminary. It wouldn't be possible if Bishop Schott hadn't done it back in 1949 and our ladies wasn't still doing it today. Now, I'm, I'm just quoting him, so it's not my plug. It's Bishop Schott's plug. This is what he says. God will bless your generosity to him in this cause more than in any other thing that you may do for him. That's Bishop Schott. So, next year when the Pentecost collection rolls around, remember what Bishop Schott said. <laughs> um, here's another thing he wrote. So, he, he was responsible, as pastor, he's responsible for everything. But he also had a good connection to the Holy Name Society. And he was involved in the CCW and in um, our ushers. Our ushers were very organized back in the day. They were the Order of St. Joseph. And he would write them letters once a year talking about the state of affairs and any updates or changes they would do in their ministry. And this is a really, really fun list. And there's one funny part I want to share. So this is a list of eight things for the care of the church during services outside of the sanctuary. So this is the sanctuary, and behind is the sacristy. He's talking to the ushers. The ushers were in charge of everything else. And this is one, one of the things he said. Distribute the weekly bulletin of announcements to the people as they leave the church, underlined. No bulletins should be available as the people enter the church, for it is read during Mass and often left in the seat when it is intended to be taken home for careful reading and handy reference. I know so many pastors who, who would agree with the same sentiments. We still give it out at the end because of Bishop Schott. Um, 
I mean, it, you can see it. You can see it when, when Father's homily isn't that great. People start looking at the bulletin. And, All right, who gave money this week? What's happening next week? Is Father done yet? <laughs> Bishop Schott knew that too. He had that same problem. What else did he do? Um, oh, uh, so I, I, I was doing some research, and the way I learned about some of his connection to the USO was, like I said, he was a bishop, so he was pretty popular. He would be on Catholic radio talk shows. So he was on the Catholic Hour, which is a na- was a national hour radio station. And he had one interview with, about the USO and his work with them, specifically the NCCS, the Catholic branch. And this interview was published in a newspaper, and I couldn't copy the newspaper because it's copyrighted, from Illinois. It was, I believe, Rockville, Illinois, that uh, this, I wrote it down. Yeah, Rockville, Illinois. And they just have it online. And there are some great quotes about his work with the USO. So I just want to share this one with you. Um, He's talking about the value of Catholic ministry for military men. Instruction and counsel can be given over a cup of hot coffee or in the midst of a boxing show or basketball game. Much helpful advice can be proffered and without repugnance to listeners as a priest sits through a movie with them or observes the gyrations of the latest jitterbug artists. I like that. The gyrations of the latest jitterbug artists. Neglected confirmation can be remedied. Marriage is properly prepared and witnessed. Frequency of the sacraments encouraged and the stream of religious knowledge and practice widened and deepened. So Bishop Schott was supporting something he lived out here in the parish. He was present here in the parish, and he saw the value in that for when you're ministering to the men in the military. Priests present in their everyday lives would be better able to serve and minister to those men-at-arms. Even observing the latest gyrations of jitterbug artists. I used to dance the jitterbug, but not anymore. So those are a little, a few anecdotes and stories about Bishop Schott and his legacy, his life and legacy, right, Father? His life and legacy. Um, that's what I've learned, that's what I've discovered, that's what I've enjoyed getting to know about him. Some of you actually knew him. And you can probably tell stories that I can't tell. So feel, feel free to hang about and share your own stories. I'd like to hear some of them before I turn in. Um, one last story. And this is a Father Frank story, so I'm going to share it, okay? When uh, the diocese was updating their archives, they did not have a single photograph of Bishop Shot. They had paintings and copies of paintings, but they didn't have an official photograph. And Father Frank and some of the parish staff found this photograph and a few others. Eileen, Eileen found them in the stationary closet. And weren't they lucky that they were in the stationary closet and not the moving closet? That's a Father Frank joke. That was good. <laughs> it always stays in one place. It's easy to find, the stationary closet. Easy to find. And so they found these photographs, and now these are the official photographs that the diocese uses in their archives. And here's one of them. This is probably just a copy. Bishop McDevitt would have it because um, Father Schott was a principal there at one point. Um, We have three other pictures. There's one in the back. Father Bradley was given a photograph by Bishop Schott. Henry Muldoon was given a photograph of Bishop Schott. She has in her home. And then here in the sacristy uh, is another one which was given to Michelle, Mary Ruffin, Ruffin, who was the cook in the rectory for sometimes as many as five priests. So this is actually a little piece of history. And there's another one in the back if you want to see it. That is all I have for Bishop Schott and his life and legacy. Let's close in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, you give us shepherds to lead us. They find their example in you, the perfect shepherd. 
Shepherd our souls and let us be inspired by the example of your servant, Bishop Lawrence Afshot, and help us to imitate him who imitated you to be faithful and humble followers of your sacred heart. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.